Most lakes go somewhere. Into a river, the ocean, something. However, some lakes go nowhere. They feed no river, pour into no sea. These lakes are endorheic. But what does that mean? How do they form? What lives near them? And where does the water go? This video will answer all those questions and more. Let's explore the lakes that go nowhere. But first, if you like human and natural history, subscribe to The Yellow Bird for more videos like this. 97% of the Earth's surface water is exoraic. Exo meaning outside and raic meaning to flow. Runoff flows into streams, which flow into lakes, which flow into rivers, until eventually the water reaches the ocean. Endoraic basins, on the other hand, have no outflow. Endo meaning within. Water within these regions will never reach the ocean. Instead, water flows into an inland basin or depression where it accumulates. For this video, endoraic basin refers to the entire drainage basin, and endoraic lake or sea will refer to the terminal water bodies within these basins. Without an outflow, most water loss is due to evaporation and, to a lesser extent, seepage. Endoraic lakes are often salty because water evaporates, but minerals don't. Over time, salts and minerals accumulate and concentrate in the water. Endoraic lakes with fresh water usually have higher levels of groundwater seepage, drawing minerals out of the lake. What prevents water in endoraic basins from reaching the ocean? Water naturally flows downhill, and usually the furthest thing downhill is the ocean, so most water flows towards it. Endoraic lakes are found mostly in arid or semi-arid climates or far inland. In dry regions, there isn't enough surface runoff to erode land barriers blocking routes to the ocean. Instead, water collects at a low point inland. This effect is amplified the further inland you go. There needs to be a lot of water to reach the ocean when it's thousands of kilometers away. Furthermore, several systems that historically reached the ocean became endoraic as precipitation decreased. The Caspian Sea and Lake Chad are two examples. A quarter of the Earth's continental area falls within endoraic basins, though they contain surprisingly little water. Less than 3% of terrestrial water is found in endoraic basins, about as much as the Yangtze River discharges annually. This water scarcity underlines the importance of endoraic lakes ecologically and socioeconomically. Larger endoraic lakes and seas impact the climate by moderating temperature, humidity, and precipitation, much like the ocean does in coastal regions. This helps stabilize continental climates, which naturally experience extreme temperature fluctuations seasonally. Inland seas and lakes also form critical habitat for endemic and migratory species. These unique ecosystems also shape the cultures that inhabit them. They provide a source of water, food, transport, and energy. Several empires were born along the shores of endoraic lakes. This includes the Mexica or Aztec Empire of what is now Mexico, and the Kanem Bornu Empire of North Central Africa. Let's look at five endoraic lakes around the world, their unique ecosystems, cultural significance, and economic importance. The Caspian Sea in Central Asia is not only the largest endoraic lake, but the largest water body in the world by area. Located in Central Asia, four countries border the Caspian, Azerbaijan, Iran, Kazakhstan, Russia, and Turkmenistan. A third of all inland water lies in the Caspian. The drainage basin that feeds the Caspian Sea is roughly 3.6 million square kilometers, with the Volga River being responsible for 80% of inflow. As the name suggests, the Caspian Sea is saline, though only about a third as salty as the ocean on average, and it's sometimes considered brackish water as a result. The climate varies across the Caspian. The north has a moderate continental climate, the southwest has subtropical influences, and the eastern shore is desert. Hundreds of plants and animals live in or near the Caspian. Some are found nowhere else in the world, like the endangered Caspian seal. These marine mammals live on the sea ice that forms in the northern sea during the winter and reside in the warmer southern waters during the summer. Fishing is a critical industry in the Caspian Sea. It's abundant in herring, pike, perch, sprat, and sturgeon. And 90% of the world's black caviar comes from Caspian sturgeon. Transport and fossil fuel extraction are also important industries on the sea. The rivers that feed the Caspian are diverted to irrigate crops, and dams are built to generate electricity. However, these practices have altered the water table, causing sea levels in the Caspian to decline. Half the world away lies the Great Salt Lake, a hypersaline endoraic lake in the U.S. state of Utah. Great Salt Lake lies within the largest endoraic basin in the Americas. 
the Great Basin spans across the American Southwest with an area of more than 500,000 square kilometers. Though not all of this water flows into the Great Salt Lake, it is the largest lake in the basin. A railroad built in 1959 splits the Great Salt Lake into a north and south arm and blocks most of the flow between them. Furthermore, all three rivers that feed into the Great Salt Lake drain into the south arm. As a result, the northern arm is much saltier and less hospitable than the southern arm, though both are saltier than the ocean. The only organisms that can survive in the north arm are halophiles, organisms which are adapted to hypersaline environments. Two species of bacteria are known to inhabit the north arm, which are responsible for its pinkish or violet color. In contrast, the southern arm boasts an abundance of life. Wetlands surrounding the Great Salt Lake contain a mix of fresh, brackish, and salt water. The different microenvironments created form critical habitat for birds, fish, amphibians, reptiles, and invertebrates. Up to 12 million migratory birds from 330 species rely on the Great Salt Lake for food, breeding, and nesting including eared grebes, Wilson's phalarope, American pelicans, and snowy plovers. This lake is important for Utahns as well, beyond being the capital's namesake. The Great Salt Lake contributes roughly $1.9 billion to Utah's economy annually. It produces 14% of the world's supply of magnesium, which is used in computers, aircrafts, and car parts, and 40% of the world's brine shrimp eggs, which are essential to aquaculture. This next lake is what inspired this whole video in the first place. In northern Tanzania lies Lake Natron, a lake of extremes. Water temperatures can exceed 40 degrees Celsius, and most notably, Natron is a soda lake, meaning it contains high quantities of dissolved sodium and carbonate. These dissolved minerals make Lake Natron alkaline, with a pH between 9 and 10.5 depending on water levels, similar to that of ammonia. This lake lies in the East African Rift Valley, here, the Earth's crust is ripping itself apart. The region is full of volcanic activity, which gives Lake Natron one of its defining features. South of the lake is the old Doño Lengai volcano. The lava and ash from this particular volcano are rich in sodium and potassium carbonates. Debris from eruptions wash into Lake Natron, and as the water evaporates, salts and minerals concentrate in the lake, which is why the lake is so caustic. Lake Natron's alkalinity and temperatures may lead one to think the lake is inhospitable, but it's precisely these conditions that give it life. The bright red color in the lake comes from cyanobacteria that live in the water. Adapted to such a harsh environment, these bacteria provide a crucial food source for the lesser flamingo, and gives them their lovely color. Once every few years when water levels are just right, more than 2 million lesser flamingos descend upon Lake Natron to breed. The lake not only provides a source of food for the flamingos, but its caustic waters protect their nests and hatchlings from predators. From one side of the African continent to the other, on the border between Nigeria, Niger, Chad, and Cameroon lies Lake Chad. 90% of Lake Chad's water flows in from the Chari River. This lake falls within the largest endorheic basin in Africa, the Chad Basin, with a drainage area of roughly 2.5 million square kilometers that extends into the Central African Republic and Sudan. Unlike the other lakes so far on this list, Lake Chad is freshwater. There are two main factors that contribute to this. The first is that the surrounding soil has relatively low salt content, so less salt is carried into the lake by rivers and runoff. The second factor is groundwater seepage. Water from Lake Chad and the minerals dissolved within seep into groundwater and aquifers. This removes salts from the lake and helps keep the water fresh. Lake Chad has a rich human and natural history. Hundreds of bird species reside in the region, both seasonally and permanently. Ostriches, secretary birds, ground hornbills, glossy ibises, and African spoonbills live near the lake. Nile crocodiles, rock pythons, and spitting cobras can also be found. A rich variety of fish live in the lake too, which are important ecologically and economically. The Chad Basin has been continuously inhabited since 500 BCE and contains the earliest discovered evidence of hominid occupation in West Africa. During the medieval period, Lake Chad served as an important hub connecting North and West African trade routes. From the 9th to the 19th centuries, it was home to the powerful Kanem Bornu Empire. Today, Lake Chad is an important source of food, water, and income to the communities that live near its shores. More than 40 species of fish are important commercially. Water from the Chari River is vital for agriculture and urban growth, though this diversion has led to the lake shrinking. The last endorheic lake on this list is another freshwater lake, 
Frame Lake is located in Yellowknife, the capital of Canada's Northwest Territories. There's a walking trail around the whole lake. Along its shores are the territories' legislature and heritage museum. When the lake freezes in the winter, it becomes a thoroughfare for snowmobiles, snowshoers, and skiers alike. What's unique about Frame Lake is that it's not in an endorheic basin, and it isn't naturally endorheic. It's been made that way by people. Frame Lake is located within the massive Arctic drainage basin in Canada. Historically, Frame Lake would have fed into Great Slave Lake, then the Mackenzie River, before draining into the Beaufort Sea on the Arctic coast. The lake was home to Lake Whitefish, Northern Pike, and Suckers, and was used as a fishing camp by the Yellowknives Dene First Nation, who knew the lake as Enati. When industrial activity began in the region, the camp was abandoned by the Dene. Frame Lake then served as a popular locale for swimming and fishing in the 1950s and 60s. But by 1973, studies found that the lake was devoid of fish. So what killed Frame Lake? Gold mining in the region contaminated much of the Yellowknife area with arsenic trioxide, a byproduct of extracting gold from ore. Urban development in Yellowknife disrupted Frame Lake's inflow and outflow, which made the lake endorheic. Over time, the lack of drainage led to nutrients and pollutants concentrating in the lake. Excess nutrients in the water caused eutrophication, the proliferation of algae blooms. The algae depleted oxygen levels in Frame Lake and suffocated the fish. The good news is that there's been efforts to revive Frame Lake. More about that can be found on my website, link in the description. Endorheic basins and their lakes are vital for the ecosystems and societies that live in or near them. These lakes and rivers provide habitat, water, food, income, energy, life. However, the nature of endorheic basins makes them particularly vulnerable to changes in climate and water usage that have significant downstream consequences. Climate change is leading to shifts in terrestrial water storage, water stored on or underneath continents. Water is moving out of endorheic basins and into exorheic basins. Annually, about five Great Salt Lakes worth of water is lost from endorheic basins globally. Water mismanagement is also a serious threat to these systems. Rivers are diverted for irrigation and dammed for generating electricity. This leads to less water reaching endorheic seas and lakes. One extreme and tragic case of mismanagement is the Aral Sea. Once the fourth largest freshwater lake, the sea has almost completely dried up. The Caspian Sea, Great Salt Lake, and Lake Chad are also shrinking. The degradation of endorheic lakes has widespread effects on plant, animal, and human life. Many are critical habitats, sometimes the sole habitat for species. They enable civilization by providing sustenance, energy, and income to people living nearby. When these habitats dry up, their resources are lost with them. Protecting endorheic basins is a complex issue as each region has its own unique threats and interests to be taken into account. This is further complicated when involved parties have conflicting interests, whether those conflicts are between ethnic groups or entire nations. Unfortunately, I don't have the answer to how to solve Central Asian water conflicts, but there are some proven ways to improve conditions. Water management and agricultural practices are critical for conserving water in endorheic basins. Practices like minimal tilling and crop rotation have been introduced in parts of Central Asia. These techniques help restore habitats and protect livelihoods by sequestering carbon, reducing soil erosion, and increasing crop yields. In arid and semi-arid regions, shifting away from water-intensive crops like cotton and rice to drought-resistant crops can help reduce water consumption. Additionally, many ecosystems around endorheic lakes and seas have degraded over time. Reclaiming these areas is important for their recovery and makes them more resilient long-term. Tree planting conserves water in snow-covered regions, decreases summer air temperatures, and reduces the frequency of extreme rainfall events. Vegetation also reduces the heat island effect in cities and improves the sustainability of food production. While solving issues as broad and complex as those affecting endorheic basins is challenging, there is hope. There are known strategies and practices that can help to reduce environmental damage, restore these ecosystems, and ensure people's livelihoods in both the short and long term. That's all for today's video. If you want to learn more about the endorheic basins in this video, along with others like the Aral Sea and Lake Texcoco, head to my website where I have a longer article on the subject, link in the description. If you learned something new, please give this video a like and consider subscribing to The Yellowbird for more content about human and natural history. Thank you so much for watching and have a lovely day. Bye-bye.